right, in this video, we're gonna continue the Bitcoin graph and we are getting close to finally finishing it, but we're getting to some of the most difficult stuff in terms of math, at least. In this video, we're gonna focus on the dots. I've made them yellow and I've made them bigger and that's all about my globals. That's not the hard part. The tough part is actually wrapping your head around how to get these dots to move up or down because technically I had them center here and I'm either applying some bottom padding to move them up like these two here, or I'm applying some top padding to move them down. But as you know, this is gonna be changing dynamically based on the price, so I have to have some math going on to do this. Now I know we've covered a lot of parts in this Bitcoin graph step by step, going through each little part of it. We've talked about the X axis, some important pieces we covered in the x-axis was the padding to move it to the right or to the left. And we're using some of that same stuff to get these dots spaced out horizontally. And then we're going to factor in some of the stuff we learned about the y-axis to get these things to move up and down. But as you can see over here, if you've already read this, this is the math code we're going to use to get those dots to move up or down. I have mentioned this in parts one through how many ever parts we've done so far. I think it's six parts so far to this series of the Bitcoin graph. You can make any type of graph where you have like a scatter plot and you want to connect them with some lines. This applies to any type of graph like that. So I had this component. Again, you can get this in my free components folder, test graph for Bitcoin over in globals. We've talked about a lot of these already, but some new ones here, the dot size, you can make the dots bigger or smaller. I'll make them even bigger so we can look at those. The dot color, I'll leave it at yellow, just so you can see it. And then we have five new globals that we're gonna talk about in this video. They're all the same with the exception of one little spot, and I'm getting ready to show that to you. P1 TB pad, and then we have P2 TB pad all the way to P5. Think of it like this, price one, top bottom padding. Now, instead of me opening each individual one up, they're all the same with the exception of this spot right here. That P1, you replace it with a P2, P3, P4, P5 to match with its corresponding price and that particular dot. Now, I'm going to cover all of the math that's really going on inside of here to give you some ideas of what we're really doing. And to do that, I'm going to go into this component, the test graph for Bitcoin. I'm going to go to dots, and that's the overlap group. And before we look at each individual circle, that's these yellow dots that you see here, let's go to the position of this dots overlap group. And this is very similar to what we did with the x-axis. The ability for us to shift the graph left or right, we're using that global that I've discussed in previous videos called shift dots. So looking at left padding and right padding, here's the left padding code. This is the same code as we've gone over in previous videos. If GV shift dots is positive, then we want to use that for some left padding. If GV shift dots is not positive, then we want to set this left padding to zero. For our right padding, if GV shift dots is negative, then we want to take that negative number and multiply it by negative one, which is going to make it a positive. And this is going to allow us to apply some right padding, which is going to move the dots to the left. So that's just going to simply move all of these dots, either left or right, and it's also gonna move the x-axis as we discussed in previous videos. Now here comes the important stuff. P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. All of these circles sitting inside of dots. P1 is going to be the most current price, which is going to be this one right here. So I have that dot size applied to it. I have the paint applied to it. And then the position is where things get a little bit crazy. Now the left padding, let's look at the code for left padding. Let me take it away and I want you to see what's gonna to happen to this yellow dot right here. If I take it away, it moves the yellow dot to the center because I have it anchored in the center, but you'll notice that it's not in the very center of the entire graph because we have some top or bottom padding going on. In this case, we have bottom padding, which is technically moving it up. Let me take away this top and bottom padding code. So with all the paddings removed, this P1 dot is right smack in the middle. So the left padding, we did cover that back when I covered the X axis. I want to move this yellow dot over to the right two paddings. We got one padding, two paddings. If that does not sound familiar, go back and check out the X axis graph where I went into more detail on the global variable GV pad. So let me come back and apply that calculator code to the left padding. It bumps it on over, check out the code. Again, this is what we discussed when we made the x-axis GV pad times two. And now here comes the good stuff. All right, now this dot sits in the center of this graph, so to speak. Sure, it's over to the right, but notice it's in the center in terms of being vertically spaced. Now we want this dot to either go up or down depending on how that price, in this case P1, compares to the halfway point. 
Now P1, I've made these fonts bigger. P1 right now is $6,592.24. Notice that's gonna be up here, higher, so we want this dot to go up. Therefore, we want to apply some bottom padding, but we definitely don't wanna do this manually because it's going to be changing. So what I want to do here is I wanna ask myself this. How does this price compare to the halfway point? Since this price is greater than the halfway point, we want to apply some bottom padding, which is going to move it up. We'll check out this code. So I'm applying my calculator back. As you can see, the yellow dot did move. And here's the logic. If price one is greater than the halfway point, then we want to apply some bottom padding. That bottom padding is going to be GV P1TB pad. Well, that's this code right here. Now, if price one is not greater than GV half, then we want the bottom padding to be zero, which means we're probably going to be applying some top padding to move it down. We'll see more of that in a second. But for now, let's focus on this. Since price one is greater than the halfway point, then we want to apply this padding here. Let me walk you through the math. So inside of here, I'm gonna go through this piece step by step. Now, this is the code that is that global variable. So let's look at this part right here, GV half minus GVP1. So if I take GV half minus GVP1, we're getting this number here, negative seven. So there, there's a difference of $7 and roughly 13 cents between the halfway point and price one. Now, the reason why we're getting a negative here is because half is smaller. Because look at this code here. P1 is greater than GV half right now since we have some padding going on. So if we take GV half minus GV P1, we're going to get a negative number. I want to throw away the negative, And a way to do that is we can just take math utilities absolute value. Pop your parentheses. And now we get that same number except it's positive. Now, what I want to ask myself next is, okay, that difference. Now, let's look at... GV max min diff. We've talked about this in previous videos. The difference between the maximum, the highest price and the lowest price, assume it, now we do have some GV cush going on too. Now we've talked about that in previous videos too. I know there's a lot of globals going on, but GV max min difference. The difference between the highest point and the lowest points on our graph is $17.89. But since I'm only talking about the top half or potentially the bottom half of a graph because we're centered along vertically, either we're going to apply some bottom padding to go up for the top half, or sometimes we may be applying some top padding to move down for the bottom half. So I want to divide this by two. I'm breaking that max min difference into two parts. So what just happened there when we divided it by two, we basically took whatever number we had here, $17.89. We divide that by two. $8.95 can represent the top half of the graph and the bottom half of the graph. We're breaking it up into two pieces. Now, how does this $7.13, what percentage or what decimal is this of $8.95? It's a good chunk of it because $7.13 is kind of close to $8.95. Well, how do we figure out that decimal or that percent? What I'm gonna do first of all is I'm gonna wrap this entire code here in parentheses. And then I'm gonna come here and I'm going to delete that dollar symbol. I'm gonna come up here to this new line, delete that dollar symbol, and I'm gonna put a division in between them. So those two numbers, if we took that $7 and what was it, 13 cents divided by whatever we got when we took the max min difference divided by two, that's pretty close to 80%, pretty close to 0.8. So what we wanna do here is we wanna take roughly 80% of the height of our graph. That's gonna be times GV height. And as you can see here, we're returning the same number that that code is returning right there because pretty much this code here and GVP1TB pad, they're pretty much the same code. There are some little differences in my parentheses. It doesn't really matter here because it's all about the absolute value. I know over here in this code, I have a parentheses here, and then I have doubles over here on the end. That doesn't really matter, to be honest with you, because the absolute value is what's wrapping things a little bit different. And the only time we have to really use the absolute value is this scenario when GV half minus GVP1 is negative, and we did see that earlier. But just to show you that, if I come in here and I pop my parentheses there, and I wrap one here, by me doing those two parentheses, it's just gonna take the absolute value of this entire formula. Whereas when I didn't have those two parentheses there, it's just taking the absolute value of this first part here. 
Either way is fine. As you can see, we are returning the same number. So this same concept is going to apply to P2, P3, P4, and P5. I'm going to delete all that. Now remember, this is only going to apply this code, this math, to this particular part when P1 is greater than the halfway point. That's why we have some bottom padding happening here because P1 is greater than the halfway point. Now let's look at the top padding code that I took away earlier. Right now it's returning zero, here's why. If GVP1 is less than the halfway point, it's not. But if it is less than the halfway point, we're applying that same math code. But if it's not less than the halfway point, we're returning to zero. And that's why we're getting a zero, because P1 is not less than the halfway point. But by us doing this, this dot will either go up or down, depending on how that particular price compares to the halfway point. This same concept applies to every single dot up here. The only difference, again, is to change this P1 to a P2, P3, P4, P5, and then also take into consideration the left padding. You know, that doesn't have anything to do with moving up or down. That deals with getting everything spaced correctly when you start adjusting your graph. And just to show you that, now let me come to one where we are below the halfway point. Any of these, uh, P3, P4, P5. Let me come to P4. So P4, that's going to be this one right here. Same width for the shape, same color. Position here, we don't have any left padding because this right here needs to be one spot to the left to move this dot to the left one padding. We have to apply some right padding. So notice we have a 260. Well, where is that coming from? We're just taking one padding, so that's GB pad. Notice we have two calculators down here for top padding and bottom padding. Notice now the bottom padding is returning a zero because this P4, $6,583.24, that is less than GV half, around $6,585. So notice this bottom padding is zero. Let me show you that code. It's the same thing except now we have if GV P4 is greater than GV half. We just said that it was not. So we're not going to apply any padding. We're going to return a zero for this particular piece. And that piece is the bottom padding. Check out the top padding code. If GVP4 is less than GV half, yes it is. So we're going to do GVP4TB pad. Same code that I went over a moment ago, except now that global would have a P4 right there in that spot. So hopefully you get the idea there. Um, all of these work the same way. Just make sure you deal with your left and right padding correctly as well. That was discussed in detail when we made the x-axis pieces. It's the same thing to move these dots horizontally. The new piece here was covering the vertical stuff, moving it up and down. And now that things are starting to come together, if we look at some of these prices, $6,580.24, well, look at that yellow dot. It's just below $6,581 on the Y. So that's looking good. Look at this center dot here. This center dot, FYI, no left padding, no right padding because it's smack in the middle. $6,577.17, that's down here close to the bottom. The reason why these numbers are not matching perfectly, we did discuss a global variable called GV Cush. That gives us a little bit of cushion. I've discussed that in previous videos as well. Now, the only thing we have left to do is to make these lines, and that's going to be the most difficult part to understand and for me to explain because it does require some algebra, distance formula, or Pythagorean theorem. It requires some pre-calculus to get these angles because, I mean, check it out. That line there is a lot longer than this line here or this line here. This line here is going up. This line here is going down. We have to be able to do some math to make these angles change to either slope down or slope up. And depending on how far these prices are from each other, it's going to change the length of that line. So there's a lot of math, algebra and pre-calculus mainly, to get that to work the way it should. But hopefully you do see, I mean, this works nicely. Those lines are centered up perfectly with the dots. And that's all about us creating everything in the center and applying some top padding and bottom padding. Some of you may be thinking, well, let's just start from the bottom and move it up to wherever it is. That will not get these lines centered correctly. I discussed that a while back when I made the weather graph. This is the way, in my opinion, the best way to get these lines to center up nicely with these dots. I hope that makes sense. And there you have it. That's how we get these dots up here. Now, definitely, I want to come back in here and change the size of these things and the color just to suit my taste. But 
Uh, one more piece to go, getting these lines going. That will come in part seven and hopefully the final part to this series here. But uh, I hope going through this series step by step, you are gaining a little bit more knowledge on working with padding, uh, some text globals, and maybe even a little bit of math. And that's it for this video. I hope it helped.